Uh, so are we, how about we do uh, questions that, do you want to do questions first or do you want to do questions later? Questions first? How about we do like 10 minutes of questions? Why don't you just ask your questions at some point, I'll just cut them off and then we'll get on to the class. Questions? Those are the questions that didn't come. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, I only planned about 25, 30 minutes of lecture. Uh, that's okay, you can, you can get started. Um, all right, what I want to do today is I want to show you uh, how we can implement threads. Okay? So here's what we want to do. Uh, here's a small piece of code I've written. Uh, I've wrapped it in a function because I don't want it to start, you know, that thump because I don't want it to start running until I want it to run. Okay? So I've got run zero here. The important thing is I've got a scheduler loop. I've given it a list of threads. That's right. Okay? So there we go. Um, I'm, uh, for this lecture, I'm going to do uh, what is known as cooperative multitasking rather than preemptive multitasking. Right? So just to remind ourselves what this means, uh, in cooperative multitasking, a thread cooperatively relinquishes control. In preemptive multitasking, control is taken away from the thread whether it wants, likes it or not. Okay? <coughs> so I've given myself the ability to yield explicitly. So uh, remember we talked about this, we could either do a variable capture, or, uh, so we could make Y or yield or something automatically be captured. Or we can let the thread decide what it wants to call its yielder. Um, the macro is, you know, you can, you can look up how to do a macro that does the variable capture. If we have time at the end of class, we could maybe even do that explicitly in class. Okay? So I'm calling y the yielding thing, the yielder. Okay? So here is thread 0. It says I want to call my yielder y. And um, just, for, just to make everything fit on the slide, I've given myself uh, D is just display, right? I'm going to print some output. So it's going to print uh, thread. I'm in thread 1 at position 1, then I'm going to yield control. Thread 1 at position 2, yield control. Thread 1 at position 3. And likewise, <coughs> thread 2 and 3 each print out slightly different messages saying I'm in thread 2, position 1, 2, and 3, and thread 3. Okay? So far, so good? Okay. Now, what do we expect the output of this to be? Ah! Excellent. You didn't see that. You didn't see that, but it was exactly the right answer. What do we expect the output of this to be? Okay, right answer. Yes? It could be anything. It could be anything. Uh, what does it depend on? The scheduler. Yeah. So, I mean, we have some expectation of what threads are, right? We don't really need <coughs> anything, right? Uh, for example, what is something we know we would like this to be produced as output, no matter what scheduler does? Yeah, so we want to see like nine strings in the output, right? So we don't want to see fewer than nine strings. So it's not anything. We don't want to see fewer than nine strings. We don't want to see more than nine strings either, right? We can agree on that much. Yes? You also expect to see T11 before T11. Yeah, so in fact, there's a partial order, right? We expect to see T1. We expect to see T1, the dash ones to come before the dash twos to come before the dash threes for each of these threads, right? So there's an ordering here that this comes before this comes before this. Um, do we expect this to come before this? Well, that's maybe more of a function of the scheduler. Okay. So uh, uh, the purpose of this lecture is not to implement clever schedulers. We have a whole class, I believe, dedicated to that topic. So I'm not going to talk much about the scheduling algorithm. In fact, I'm going to assume a simple round-robin scheduler. So if I have a simple round-robin scheduler, what do I expect the output to be? This is a trick question. Yes? Does it go in the order for this? Ah, okay, right. It's a trick question because I still have to tell you what order it's going to go in. So it's a round robin scheduler that goes in this order, right? In the order of the list. Then what do I expect the output to be? Everything in order. Sir? You get all those things in order. Yeah, so specifically? T11, T21, T31, T22. T1, two, two, Good. Three. Okay. Exactly. Right. So this, 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 then this, 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 then this, this, this. Okay. So I don't want to innovate on scheduling technology in class. I want to do the other parts. Um, so let's write the scheduler first. So define uh, scheduler loop uh, zero to be uh, threads. Okay. So if I have no threads, what should the scheduler loop produce? But what should it do? Error. Or 
done, right? No, I mean, not error, right? It's, it's done scheduling, right? But let's write, remember, we're writing an inductive definition here, so we should always give a sensible base case, right? So it's not necessarily an error, it just means all the threads are done. Okay? Otherwise, we've got at least one thread. So uh, what do we want to do? Well, we want to resume that thread. And when the thread is done, we want the thread to relinquish control back to the scheduler. And then the scheduler goes off to do the recursion. Yeah, the next thread. Okay. So begin. Um, so we need to do something with the first of the threads. And then we go. Um, Back to the rest of the threads. Okay? Yeah? Um, isn't this only going to print the first three strings? Because you run the first thread until it yields and then. Aha! Aha! So it looks like we're going to go through all the threads only once, right? And uh, that's not quite what we want. What do we actually want? We want to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like What's a, that? A cyclic data structure. Yeah, a cyclic data structure. We could do something even simpler, right? Which is, we could simulate the cycle. Yeah, we could just append. OK. So that achieves the same effect without worrying about cyclic data structures. Right? So we're going to do the first thread. And we're going to take the first thread and stick it onto the back of the queue. So basically, what we're simulated is a cyclic queue here. Right? We always look at the first element, but we take the first element after it's done and put it back at the end of the queue so we'll get back to it. Yes? Uh, what happens when a thread falls off the end? Oh, <laughs> good question. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in about 25 minutes. Okay? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, we, we still have to figure out what to do with the first thing, right? The first thread is a, is a first of threads is a thread. What do we do with this thread? Well, presumably, I mean, just, uh, you know, first of threads is now going to do nothing, right, as of now. So it's going to evaluate to the first value and then move right along. So this isn't going to do anything. We need to invoke it, right? So clearly, the th a thread is going to be some kind of invocable thing. It's an applicable value, right? It's let's, it's, let's say it's a function. And might we need to give something to the function? We need to give something to this function, right? The thread needs to somehow be able to know where to continue. Say say that one at a time. Know where where to yield. Where to continue. Yeah, know where to continue, know where to yeah, where, where continue is yielding, right? So it needs to remember where it needs to continue, but it also needs to go back and tell the scheduler, I have yielded, you may now call somebody else. Right? And as I said, we're doing this cooperatively. You could imagine the preemptive version is instead something inside the thread gets the yielder and automatically invokes it after like you know some number of cycles elapse and if it's on a critical region, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So the simple model is the thread is going to yield. Okay. Well, so uh, there are two things. With thread needs to internally remember how to resume, and it needs to be told. Something the scheduler is extrinsic to the thread. Right? It's not something the thread inherently knows about. There could be different schedulers. So it needs to be told. Here is how you yield, which is going to be a. It's going to be a continuation. Okay. So let's see. See, and now there's a continuation of the scheduler, and we're going to invoke the first of the threads with. So we're going to capture the current continuation. We're going to give it to the first thread in the, in the cyclic queue. It's going to go off and do its computation. Presumably, it's going to then stash away its computation. It's going to, at some point, invoke the scheduler's continuation. Where is control going to return when it invokes that continuation? Put my finger down. Where is control going to return? Whatever value it provides to the scheduler, continuation, where is that value going to appear? Up, down, left, right. 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 Where? Left. Left. There. Stop. Stop? I've got one vote for stopping. Everyone happy with stopping here? Yeah? Yeah. 
right here, right? Whatever value you give to the continuation, it's as if you took that entire let CC expression, erased it, and put that value in its place. That's what invoking a continuation does. It's like erasing that whole expression and putting the value in its place. Because that's the k at the point of creation, right? Okay, so what's going to happen is the value is going to be given over here, but this is the first of two statements in a begin, right? What do, what do, do we care about the values of the non-penultimate, non the non-final statement in a begin? We just ignore it, right? Which is exactly what's going to happen. The thread is not giving any interesting value to the yielder, it's just saying, I yielded. That's, it's got one bit of information, the fact that it has yielded, right? So we don't care what value we send, we could send some dummy value over here, but the important thing is control is going to come back here, and then it's going to go off to do the next thing, which is go back into the scheduler loop and do the next thread. Good? So far, so good? good. Question? Yeah. Uh, so just move the thread zero um, function. That which we have not yet defined, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, I mean, the way to read it is just like as, as it will execute sequentially each argument. Uh, well. Uh, you talking about this, one of these lines, or the whole thing? Um, one of the thread. Okay, so this is not, these are not arguments. Y is just the name for the yielding procedure. Okay. okay? And what it's saying is display the first, display the string, yield, display the second string, yield, display the third string. So it is sequential execution, if that's what you mean, okay. yes. Okay? Now, I could have had a loop or something in here, too, right? I could have had some sort of loop that printed us something and then yielded and printed something and yielded and so on. That would be perfectly fine. So as well. the thread function um, builds a sequential, like a begin statement. Exactly. Um, exactly. Out of, like, out of, of the pieces. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the first y in parentheses is different from the rest of the Yeah, the, the y first y is just saying what I'm going to call it <laughs> and then the rest of the actual uses of the yielder. Okay? Okay. Question? I have a vote. What was your question? <laughs> uh, uh, for some reason, I thought that the, uh, well, we said we're discarding the value coming up to the yielder, and I, I had it in my head initially that it was going, the value that was coming back was the continuation for where to resume. The ah, ah, right. So in principle, the thread could send the continuation of where to resume back to the, to the, to the scheduler. And uh, <coughs> that's a design decision, right? You could either stash it away internally, or it could return it. Um, you could go either way on that. Okay? That would be even more complicated. So it's, it's sort of conceptually cleaner to think of the thread as remembering, because then you can think of the thread as basically being its own little stack, because that more closely corresponds to what you think of as happening in the computer, right? You create a stack for each thread. It starts running down its stack or whatever, and it's got its stack pointer, right? And then you return to this other thing, right? Otherwise, you're thinking of the stack as a value that you can return, which it is. Right when you have call CC and let CC. But this is closer to the conceptual model of what happens in an operating system where you have a stack, you start running down the stack pointer, and what you do is you stash away that stack pointer and that stack, and you return to this other stack, which is this, the scheduler, right? The scheduler, when it's ready, comes back and says, okay, now my stack pointer is wherever that thread left off, okay? That's the model I'm trying to simulate here, okay? If you really want to have fun, you should try implementing that version, yeah. Is that why you have the let CC in? Well, the, 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 no, 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 hold on, hold on. This is the let CC for the scheduler. Yeah. This is the this is saying where to resume the scheduler. So would it be easier to just push that into the thread and make it the generator? Uh, we could have done that. I wanted to show this model too, okay? Um, there's going to actually be a reason, I believe, that I want it this way, okay? okay? But we can talk about it when we get further, okay? So let's get to the interesting part, which is define syntax uh, thread. Uh, well, that's thread zero. Okay, so um, <coughs> rules. Um, there's no keywords that I care about. Okay, so what do I have? I have thread zero of the name for the yielder, which I'm calling y here, and then I have some sequence of body expressions. Right, that's your sequence of body expressions there. Okay, now, what did we say? We said a, a thread is going to be a lambda that takes the scheduler's continuation, right? So it takes the scheduler's continuation, right? And uh, it's, uh, what's it going to do? It has to have somewhere 
our record, um, and I'll use lead record uh, because we're going to need it anyway. Uh, it has to have somewhere its own sort of uh, the, the the thread zone continuation, right? So the threads continuation um, is basically where do I resume control in the thread, right? And separately, there's the scheduler's continuation, which is where do, how do I go back to the scheduler? Okay. So when I come into the thread, um, I need to basically resume where the thread was last computing. So I need to invoke the threads continuation with some indication of, OK, here's the value, except what I've done is I've purposely built this very imperative model where there are no values being passed around. Things that generators were all about returning values, consuming and returning values. Right? So I'm purposely choosing a very imperative model of threads where there's no consuming and returning of values. There's just control flow going between points. And in fact, as you can see in my example, I purposely have only print statements. Right? There's nothing else. There's no values being consumed and produced. Okay? So, so this is just some dummy value. It's just like, you know, it expects to get a value because it's a continuation. So we're just going to say, oh, it's, you know, uh, some dummy value that says uh, resume. And, but don't worry about what the value is. Okay. Uh, okay. So far, so good. Now, what is the initial continuation in the thread? That's so going to get some dummy value on use underscore to say I really don't care what this value is. Okay? What is the initial value? What is the initial continuation of the thread? The continuation is everything that is waiting to be done. Initially, what is everything that is waiting to be done in the thread? The body, right? The whole body of the thread is what is waiting to be done. So I say begin and then do the body. Initially, that's everything that's waiting. OK. Now we have to define what it means to yield. Right? What does it mean to yield? This one's going to look a little more familiar. OK. What is the yielder? Well, again, I'm going to, so my yielder, in fact, if you look over here, uh, when I use the yielder, I don't even bother giving it a value because we're not doing generators anymore, right? We're just yielding. It's just an action. It's an operation. It's not giving any values. So my yielder can, in fact, be a function of no arguments. OK? And what does the yielder do? Oops, lambda of no arguments. OK? What does the yielder do? It's a do. Yeah? Get the continuation and set dk to it. Don't say the continuation. There's plenty of them floating around. The current one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you almost got me there. Um, the continuation of what thing? This thread. Yeah, the thread's continuation, right? So if I say let CC now, I'm going to get, what, what is this let CC going to be in terms of the code that I've written up over here? If I say, uh, um, let me call it uh, new TK, okay? just to be suggestive, not like it means anything. Um, so new TK is going to be bound to what? New TK is bound to the continuation at the point at which I invoke the yielder. In the body over here, where am I invoking the yielder? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six times, right? So at this point of invoking the yielder, what is the continuation inside that thread? It's everything after that, which is display t2, yield, and then display t, uh, display t12, yield, and then display t13. Right? And likewise here, 2 and 3. Okay? That's what the continuation is. Hint for those who are really following. It's actually more than that, because the scheduler is part of the continuation. Too. You didn't hear me say that. Okay? Let's pretend that's what's going on. So there's our continuation. Okay? So at the point of yielding, it's going to be the rest of this stuff. Right? So that is the thing I need to stash away. Okay? I need to set bang TK to be this new TK. Right? And this is why I had to make TK a function of one argument, even though I don't care about the argument, because call CC only makes continuations that take one argument. That's just the nature of the thing it makes. It's just a type thing for type compatibility. Even though I know I don't care about the argument, 
I, I have to make it a tight thing of one argument because otherwise called CC makes one of one argument. And the type system will in fact, if we could try this if you want, we can, if we take out that parameter, the type system will complain and say in one place you're mutating into a thing that takes one argument, in another place a thing that takes no argument and those are not type compatible. Okay? So, and in fact at runtime you would get an error. Okay? Good. So we now stashed away the continuation, which means the next time we come in, and we apply TK to some <coughs> dummy value, we are in fact going to go on inside the thread. Okay, this is good. But now what do we do? We need to uh, invoke what? The scheduler's, the scheduler's continuation, right? So we have now yielded, which means we record where we were in the thread, and we say, hey, scheduler, you go again. Okay, where is the scheduler's continuation? It's, speak up. It's the argument that we gave the thread. Right? Which is where? Uh, What's it called? SK. Oh, yeah. It's SK, right? And it's in a, sitting in a completely different scope. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> right? It's just sitting somewhere else. Um, so we want to be able to say, hey, SK, go for it. Here's a dummy value, OK? And that, that's what yielding means, right? Go invoke SK with this dummy value, right? Okay, now there's a few different ways we can deal with the scope problem. One is we can create an extra dummy thing and then we can mutate it. Or here's another solution. I'll just show you this. The, I'm, I'm purposely doing something different than what we did with generators just to show you that there's a space of different ways of writing this, okay? So what's the initial value of the yielder? The function after yeah, exactly. So the, before we've even gotten a value for yielding, we never have a value, right? Which is, it's, 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 it's the scheduler, and before it's even run, we don't have anything there. So it's just like error, yielder, should not get here, right? This is just like a, there's no way, in a properly written implementation, we should just never get here. Okay? Zero points. Uh, Yielder is in fact zero arguments. Thank you. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So do I even have? Okay. Good. Online expansion finished. So I have no type errors. That's a good start. Okay. Uh, so if I run this. Um, what was the name of my thing? Run zero? Okay. So here is all of our code. Okay. We have a scheduler loop. It takes some list of threads. So this is just a function, right? That scheduler loop is just a function. But this is, you want to think of this as my kernel here, right? This is my kernel piece of code. It takes a list of threads. When there's no threads left, it says I'm done scheduling all of those. There's nothing left to do. Otherwise, it calls the first one with a continuation saying where to come back to. When it returns, it goes back. It basically creates a cyclic queue and then goes on with the rest of the threads. Okay? Question? Maybe I'm not being, maybe I'm not being this well, but after the let rec, that lambda, where does the sk come? Oh, this one? Okay, let, let's, just, let's just finish this one here. And then now, okay. So that's our scheduler. It's just, it's almost exactly what you'd expect, right? It's just a function that just loops through, okay? Creating the cyclic queue. So what does this do? Um, so I'm creating a macro. The user provided what the name they wanted for the yielder. Its initial value is an error. Um, the body, the initial continuation is the whole body. Right? Now, what's your question about the lambda? <coughs> Where does SK come from? SK is going to be the value that was created by this let CC. So it's going to create a scheduler K. It's going to pass it off to the first, to the what is always the first thread, whatever the current thread is, okay? And that value is gonna flow into the SK position over here, okay? What am I doing? I'm updating the yielder, I'm mutating the yielder each time to be a new yielding procedure, 
And it's a new procedure because it's closed over SK, right? That's, that's really what I care about. All of this rest of this code is just, you know, it's local code, it doesn't matter. But the critical thing is SK is different each time. So each time the yielder is referring to the latest scheduler continuation, okay? And then I go off and invoke the rest of the body. And yielding, what does it do? It just updates the continuation of the thread. Question, there was another hand up there. No, I was, I was gonna ask why you need let rec instead of let, but I remember that let. Ah, so okay, why do we need let rec? Why do we need let rec? Because let won't, you, won't let you access set bang yielder over there. Yeah, so the problem is the inside this b dot 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 here in the body, we have instances of yielder, right? And the yielder in turn is, uh, you know, gonna refer to tk over here, right? So, they need to. so this particular case we could have done like one, one let and then the other one. The point is that the body is dependent on the yielder, the yielder is dependent on the body. Right? That's the high level prod issue. Okay. Good. Okay, are we ready to run it? Um, what did I call it? Uh, let me have definitions. Uh, run zero, was that what it was called? Okay. Um, why does it say type is return type symbol? That's done. Done. That's right, right? It's a, it's a scheduler that returns done. Okay, what do we expect to have happen now? Infinite loop. Infinite loop. Yeah. You never remove something from the cycle. Oh, well, yeah, well, okay. Um, that's an interesting point. Okay. I never seem to actually remove anything from the cyclic queue, but, but, that's a, but, but I fall out of the bottom, right? So I stop printing, I mean, I print the three things and then I just fall out of the bottom so there's no more printing to happen. <laughs> right? You're still running. Right, 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 right. Okay, so you're suggesting I should stay paused over the, <laughs> or hovered over the stop button. Oh, it's printing, it's printing, it's printing, it's printing, it's printing. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, let's first look at the, Let's look at the top, of the beginning of the output, okay? Let's just make sure that that looks like what we want. Ah, hey, look. We got T11, T21, T31, T12, T22, T32, T13, T2, T3, T3. We're done. <laughs> yes, no? Well, there's a slight nuisance, right? Where did we leave off? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What's this? T13, T23, T33, T13, T2, T3, T2, T3, 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 T3. Oh, this pattern is kind of suggestive of something. It didn't fall. Okay, so first of all, we did get to the, we, we, so first of all, notice we got our round robin scheduler, right? We, we actually have something that looks like, you know, it's like your, it's the, it's, you know, probably 80% of the 169 students get this kind of thread, right? <laughs> Did they get this far? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. This is a really weird thread box. Because like you have restartable continuations that you don't uh, already Yeah, well no you do. You just choose not to give themselves to you and give yourself them, right? Um So what's going on? Yeah. So um after you fall out of the bottom it hasn't saved the continuation like Ah, so it's ah it's from Exactly. The so the continuation that has been stored in the thread is the La I mean, basically what happens, it gets the, th so first of all, you've correctly observed we never kick anything out of the cy cyclic queue, right? So we keep going back to things in the cyclic queue. But what has been remembered is the last thing that, ha that was stored, right? The last continuation, and that is the point of the last yield, right? So yes, we do fall off the bottom, and control returns to the scheduler. It actually comes back as a return rather than as a continuation invocation. Right? That was my hint that there's actually more to the continuation than the scheduler sitting at the bottom. So control return to the scheduler, right? That's the real difference from the operating system is this, this stack is actually sitting on top of this stack without, without you completely realizing it, okay? And so control returns to the bottom, and at that point it says, okay, I need to invoke it again, and this is the stored continuation. Well, so one thing we can do is at the end of it, we could actually like, you know, capture another continuation that says, this is the continuation that really represents the end. But is that what we really want? Because what would happen then? We still wouldn't get rid of anything. But you keep on descending into the thread. Next. We're just going to the thread, print nothing, go into the thread, print nothing, so we'd have an infinite loop that doesn't actually do anything. 
right? So rather, we would like to actually have our threads terminate. Right? <coughs> now, one thing we could do is we could make the code of thread more complicated. Is that what we want? No, I mean, the programmer has already expressed their intent. It's our problem as the language implementers to make, it, make the intent be what happens. So let's do this, okay? Define type, um, define type thread status is, uh, it's either a uh, suspended or a key done, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna give myself this new data type that's just like one bit. Am I suspended or am I actually done? So now, we're going to actually return an interesting value to the scheduler. Okay? The interesting value is, are we suspended or are we done? Okay. So we're <coughs> get this value back. And we're going to get either or done. Okay. okay, what do we do in the suspended case? If the thread is suspended but not yet done, what do we want to do? Yeah, just do what we were doing before, right? Which is this. Okay. Um, separate right? Yeah. The parentheses around the T suspended should be after it. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, that's what looked wrong. Okay, good. Now, if this thread signals that it is done, what do we do now? Yeah, we just recur on the rest, right? So, uh, scheduler loop zero on rest of threads. Okay? We're good? All right. So you see there's a type error down there. Type check failed. Symbol versus T status. You're returning comments. Ah, yeah. See, remember previously I said I didn't care about the return values. So I was returning these dummy values. Now I really need to care. Okay? So, uh... Where do I, where am I? Which which dummy is it that I care about? Aha. TK dummy. TK dummy is what? TK dummy oh, is the continuation called. inside the thread, right? Which is where am I returning the value to? The where am I falsely returning a symbol value to that the system is complaining about? The the scheduler, right? So what do I tell the scheduler instead of dummy? Well, so it's either T suspended or T done. Which one is it? This is the suspension case. Okay. And good. Type checking is done. So I have suspended the program at this point. <coughs> but I need some other way of signaling that I'm done, right? Where am I actually done? Yeah, at the end of the whole thing. So we'll have the same pattern again. Um, so we'll say uh, finisher is a lambda error finisher should not get here, okay? Because it also needs to close over the uh, SK thing, right? But now, is it gonna keep a current continuation? Does it care about the thread's continuation? Well, no, by definition not, we're done, right? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna call the scheduler continuation and say, hey, I'm done. Okay, what, what's missing? Yeah? You have to call finisher. Yeah, we never call finisher. Where do we call finisher? At the beginning. At the? At the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what happened? Control went through B dot dot dot, went through all the body terms, right? The last thing in the body needs to be, I'm done. And we just agreed we don't want to put this burden on the developer. But we can do this in the macro, right? So the continuation, so let's do this. Right? So what's happening is 
Um, I get to the last yield, I capture a continuation, which is going to be print the third thing in my thread and then finish. Right? So when that continuation gets invoked, it's going to print the third thing in its thread. It's going to get invoked with the latest scheduler continuation. It's going to print the third thing in its thread, and then it's going to come to finisher, which is now closed over that continuation. It's going to send a key done, and that's going to go back to the scheduler. Scheduler is going to say, I'm done. OK. Uh, should we try this? Mm -hmm. For empty threads, don't you need to return a T done? This is a really great question. When you get to the empty threads here, what should we return? Should we return T done? Doesn't matter. Should we return? Are we required to return T done? Why not? What is T done really about? It's about threads. It's about an individual thread, and it's, uh, it's not a scheduler. It's a, that's right. So T done is the individual thread signaling to the scheduler what its status yeah. is, right? Which is different from the value of the scheduler itself. I mean, this this done is actually something you never see, right? It's the operating system; it just like stops or something like that. Or if it's Linux, it does. You know, it goes to screensaver mode, which is what the like, I main value of Linux seems to be. So. Um, so uh, run zero is uh, what? It's still uh, uh, returning a symbol, which is fine, right? Because it's different from the key done thing. And by the way, a hint is our type checker has actually type checked. So, okay. Um, okay. Hover over stop. Uh, high definitions. Okay. Everyone ready? Done. <laughs> we have threads. Um, there's actually uh, there's a very interesting thing that's going on here. Uh, oh. Okay. I'll tell you what. I'll send you a version of the code for those of you who followed everything until now. I'll send you a version of the code to the class list. Um, I. And it will not. Should I tell you? I... <laughs> yeah, tell us. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let me show you the code actually. Um, so I wrote the scheduler initially. This was an actual bug that I had. I wrote the scheduler a little differently. So Y is, of course, the yielder, and SK is what I wanted to call the scheduler's continuation. Okay? So I was explicitly calling Y of SK. This was an ugly interface. I mean, this is not what you want to give a programmer. But I was just sort of experimenting with the code. Um, and so otherwise, everything else is the same. And it kept going into this infinite loop, even after I had this thing here, right? So this is exactly the you know check check for the status and you know it's uh, it's send, sends out a suspended versus sends out a done and my scheduler was um, doing exactly what you'd expect it was checking whether it was suspended or done if it was suspended it was continuing further if it was done it was stopping and the fix was this which was to mutate the list of threads. Now, why on earth would you need to mutate the list of threads? I mean, we just saw this version work, right? This is the version that had sort of this functional list of threads. Worked fine. Why would I need mutation? These thoughts of all? Yeah. Because you had already passed in the continuation to the other thing, and then it wasn't getting back out again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, shh. You are so close, so close. You're, you're exactly on the right track. What was happening was it was closing over. Okay, so to give you give you an analogy, a pretty direct uh, uh, more than an analogy. You remember with the generators, we saw this case where the initial. So every time you call a generator, you give it a value, but it can choose to use that value or ignore that value. Right? So we had like, these generators that counted up from 1 to 10 or something like that. And the second time you call it with like 100 and it still gives you a 2. You call it a 200, it still gives you a 3. Right? Because it had already got its internal state all set up. And it was ignoring the value that was coming in. 
essentially what happens is the scheduler continuation you pass in, the question is, is it using the latest scheduler continuation or is it using the initial scheduler continuation that it had? And if it uses the initial scheduler continuation, because of the nature of lexical scope, right? In this version, it's closed over threads. Remember what the continuation is. It's a procedure, right? Procedures are closed over lexical scope, but they are agnostic to the values in the store. So changes to the store they see, changes to the lexical scope they basically don't because that's the whole point, right? That's what it meant to be statically scoped. So if threads is a statically scoped value, then it always closes over the initial continuation, which is the one that has all of the threads in it. So even though dynamically it genuinely is dropping the threads, the continuation is still closed over the initial value that has all of the threads. And no matter what you do dropping threads, they just never get dropped. And the only way to make them drop is by forcibly using the thing that the store, that, that the environment does not close over, which is this. So it's actually still invoking the initial continuation every time. But the initial continuation is not closed over the threads. You notice there's uh, this loop over here has no arguments. So it's not closed over the set of threads. And because the set of threads is being mutated, it actually sees the difference. And this is actually an interesting point because when you write a thread, when you write a thread package, you actually put the same scheduler, like the, the, the few bytes of assembly code at the bottom, the bottom of all of your threads. Right? This is how you do it. You have this like this little, you have the thread, and at the bottom is the same thing. Right? And that's kind of a static thing that doesn't change. Because there is a reference to a mutable set of threads. That's what an operating system has, has a mutable queue of the set of threads. So in a funny sense, this is actually closer to what a real operating system is doing, right? What I'm doing over here is a little bit of a fake because every time I'm getting a new continuation, I'm creating a new yielder that's closed over a new continuation. And the reason I need to do that is because I wrote this in a sort of more functional style, right? Had I instead made this mutate the list of threads, that would more closely resemble exactly what your operating system thread scheduler is doing. And then this one would just be closed over the initial continuation and would never bother taking a new scheduler continuation. Because in fact, in the OS, you just have a small set of bytes at the bottom and that's just fixed. And when you run down, you run out of it. Continuations and state, great fun. So here we go, but that's it, right? I mean, here's like, and I've shown you there's another version that uses a mutation, right? And this is literally, <coughs> um, do I have, I should not have any lines at the bottom, right? Oh, I, yeah, I do, I have. There we go. Ah. Okay, on the screen, I have fit a complete thread package. <laughs> Right? And it really does, and you know, if we wanted to do something other than round robin scheduling, where would we go change code? Yeah, right here, right? Basically, this right here is our design decision about what thread we're going to pick next, right? So you could, for example, have a thread return some information about, so right now we just have these, these uh, sort of nullary status indicators, right? There's just literally one bit of status. But you could imagine that the thread does something more sophisticated, like it says, here's how long I ran, right? And that now becomes a second parameter, or here's how much resource I consumed <coughs> in some fashion, and that becomes a second parameter. And now what you have here is a cleverer function that basically looks at this list and comes back and says, you know, here's the actual next thread that's going to be run based on its history. Notice, for those of you who've especially taken uh, 19, if we were to do that, we would no longer be structural in this argument. We'd be generative. Because we'd have a function that computes what the next list is supposed to be. If we did that, what argument, what is the problem with generative recursion? We have to? Eureka. You need a Eureka, okay. What's the other problem with it? Termination. termination. We don't know whether we'll even get to all the elements. We don't know whether we'll run out of things. So the termination is sort of uh, ensured by the fact. So there's an argument to be made, and the argument is like the thread always runs down. Well, and if the thread doesn't terminate, it doesn't terminate. But the other problem is that like, we have to make sure we even get to all the elements. Here, we know we'll get to all the elements. Just the structure, the data tells us we'll get to all the elements. But if I have a generative structure, I don't know whether I'll necessarily get to all the elements. 
And what is that problem called in operating system scheduling? There's a name for that. And its cousin, its first cousin? Fairness. Fairness. Right? That's exactly what fairness is. And there's actually different notions of fairness. One of my favorite papers, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful, gorgeous theory paper from the mid-80s. It's called Fairness, Justice, and Impartiality. <laughs> and there are three slightly different definitions of what it means to be fair when you have infinite word automata. Right? That's the right way to think about these. These are infinite word automata, where each word, each uh, the alphabet of the automaton, is what a, the, the set of threads. Right? So if I have threads T1, T2, T3, my alphabet is T1, T2, T3. But since they can run forever, the string that's produced by this la the language is a set of infinite words, right? And so these are notions of different notions of fairness in infinite word automata. It's absolutely gorgeous work. And that's what happens. We have to argue, we have to come up with a proof that whatever algorithm we have chosen here, the function that computes the, re the, the value on the recursive call, the, the generator, the generator, actually implement some notion of fairness that we have to separately define. Right? Otherwise, we don't. We might, in fact, starve a thread or starve one or more threads. And then you can worry about additional properties, like if I have priorities for threads, do the highest priority threads always win? And then I have to worry about priority inversion. Right? All of that sort of proof technique is packaged up right here in how I choose to make this thing. And the round robin is nice because it's nice and structural. But all that cleverness notice is embodied over here, right? This part stays essentially the same. I mean, maybe it gives you some additional information, but it stays essentially the same. And the essence of threads is this, right? The essence of thread is I capture the continuation, I call in, I remember where I last was, I yield back to the scheduler, and it's all there in calls to see. And now you can start to see that there's a deep similarity between threads, generators, and coroutines because they all have essentially the same structure. I mean, I purposely messed around by putting the set bang in here just to show there's two different ways to do it. And in the generator case, I had these things up here and I mutated the values in there. It's all the same thing, right? It's essentially fundamentally the same thing. And call CC is what reveals the deep similarity. Good, question. If you wanted to allow for the um, scheduling to decide like when it should be suspended, you just have to insert like a yield after every single... Yeah, that, that would be one way to do it. The yield, you could have a yield after every one, or you could send a policy into the thread. You could send a function into the thread, and the thread would then use that function periodically to determine should I yield now, should I yield now, right? There's a notion, there's a related notion to threads called engines. Engines are things that you give a fuel, and when that fuel gets to zero, they yield, right? That's one special case policy. You can bake in, that's a baked in policy, you can have a different policy. So like if they wanted to execute some statement, they have to pass it into the engine and the engine... Yeah, essentially, essentially, yeah. The other thing you can do is you can actually, in this thread here, you could insert yields wherever you wanted to, and that would essentially be preemption, right? Like I could put a yield after every B or some, whatever I do here, if I automatically insert yields here, that's preemption. The policy of preemption is the policy of what algorithm I use to insert Ys into Bs. Right? Yeah? You can't just put yields in the syntax, right? Because you have to know what functions are being called and change their definitions that yield? Or, or don't you? Well, this is just a sequence of statements and somewhere inside that sequence. Oh! What if one statement calls a function? You, so that's why our engines get more sophisticated. So engines basically have this notion of fuel and the system tracks how much fuel you've used up. Okay, so when the fuel hits zero, like, is it every application, for example, right? <coughs> and you can actually do that with racket macros, but now we're seriously in racket mind. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Monday, we start a whole new topic. Please get caught up with everything in the book and everything in the notes and quizzes and everything else. This is your last chance to get caught up. Start a whole new topic Monday.